We're live. But not anymore. Oh, no. What? Presumably. Gary, are we live? Yeah. Oh. I tweeted the link. Well, you could have told us we were live. I did. No, you didn't. And I didn't even tweet the link. Retweet my... I just tweeted the link, so retweet this me. This is ridiculous. How is this? This is no way to start <laughs> a new series of Tisky Sour and myself and Michael Walker. How are you doing, Michael? Very well. How are you, Aaron? Why have we been gone away for so long? Uh, I blame you, Aaron. I think it was uh, your book, Fully Automated Luxury Communism. Okay. It's, I taken blame you, it's taken you away. I blame your master's degree at the LSE. Look, Aaron, I've, I've done an episode of Tisky in your absence with Sarah Jaffe. You weren't there. What Sarah, was I to do? Sarah Jaffe, the boss. Jaffe. The gaffer. She does a podcast, so we know how to pronounce it. Is she just trying, is she just trying to sort of appease white guilt? I, I'm not. I don't know. That was a joke. For any Jordan Peterson fans watching this, by the way, much of this is not serious. Okay, just to be clear, although we are Marxists. I'm so, not. I'm a Marxist. Prepare to be triggered. Uh, we'll be talking about fake news and communist lobsters. So invariably we're covering this story, uh, which has really just defined the last seven days of the British media, with Jeremy Corbyn being a suspected, acclaimed Czechoslovak security asset uh, and it's all sort of fallen apart in the last 24 hours in particular. What's going on, Michael? Um, so, this story was broken, if you can give it that name, on Thursday by The Sun, the title, the headline being Corbyn and the commie spy. They had got information from former Czech diplomat Jan Sarkoci, and he'd claimed Corbyn not only had passed on information, but was in the pay of communist Czechoslovakia and was known as Agent Cobb. Um, this made its way from the Sun to the Mail to the Telegraph and the Times. The problem is, this guy is a complete crank. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any factual basis in what was said. We know this now from. Wait, what's his name? Uh, his name is Jan Sarkoci. That sounds kind of familiar. Didn't he organise Live Aid? Ah, we're not sure. He he either organised Live Aid or the Free Nelson Mandela concerts. Right. That's what he claims. Uh, and the information he was asking for from Jeremy Corbyn was, was very, very vital secrets of state. Uh, you know what they were? Go on. What Margaret Thatcher had for breakfast and what she was going to wear tomorrow. So if you were in the Czech government mm. and you're think, you know, you've got some serious foreign policy discussions going on, you need to know what Margaret Thatcher is wearing the next day. Jeremy Corbyn doesn't even know what Jeremy Corbyn's going to wear the next day. <laughs> That's true. I mean, he doesn't care, right? I and mean, he, he, he talks about that. He, he buys all his clothes from like this like clothing co-op or something in Islington. Oh, does he? That's yeah. very nice. I mean, probably not, probably not anymore, right? I mean, he's in GQ magazine and stuff. But back in the day, yeah. I mean, if he knew what Margaret Thatcher was going to wear the next day, that would be an even bigger controversy than him being a communist spy. The affair of the unexpected affair of the 1980s. I mean, that would trump... Uh, John Major and uh, what was her name? Edwina Curry. Edwina Curry. Oh my God! Well, this. Well done, Michael. God. Well, anyway, so this crank uh, was saying that he had actually a ring. It turns out of fifteen Labour MPs, mm. including John McDonnell. The only problem is that John McDonnell wasn't an MP in the late nineteen eighties. He was working for Camden Council. He was Why in the GRC, would... no. I think he was kind of... London, strategic city. I think he'd gone at this point to Camden Council. He was at Camden Council before 92 anyway. Okay. Because um, the GLC's like folded, right? Yeah, but that... this was in the early 80s, which was exactly when the GLC but was this running. Is, no, this is 87. This is 87. Yeah, I think the GLC was folded 86. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So whatever. I mean, John McDonnell wasn't working in Parliament. He wasn't a Labour MP. He was working in local government. The idea that the Czech security services would have... Uh, agents or assets in local government is just potty, mm -hmm. to be frank. Uh, and, I mean, the Czechs, the Czechoslovaks, by the way, sorry to invisibilize Slovak Slovakia like this, mm. you know, th this erasure of Slovakia by the print media is really outlandish and disgraceful. Um, if if the Czechoslovaks had 15 Labour MPs, how many did the Soviets have? 100? Because it wasn't... A, like, Czechoslovakia's not a big player, mm. right? Well, they might have swapped... You know, they're probably... Shared spies, right? They'd share informants. I don't... I mean, it doesn't make any sense. They did have... So they did have a couple of spies 
in the 60s and 70s. The two, Soviets two, did. Two Labour MPs and a Tory. Kim yeah, Philby the Soviets and, did. Kim Philby and a Tory guy. And they had a nickname for him, which was like, he just asked for too much money. Mm. Money bags. But look, anyway, the point is this. The story from the outset was clearly not true. Uh, as I think Joseph Goebbels said, you lie big. You keep on lying. That's what the print media tried to do with their outriders. Uh, Guido Fawkes, Fraser Nelson, The Spectator. It was even enabled quite grotesquely by Matthew Dancona at The Guardian. And um, I don't think they expected this kind of kickback, did they? From Jeremy Corbyn, from the left. And of course, that was, the culmination of that was this video last night that he put out on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so exactly. So I mean, I think when The Sun and these papers broke this story and when the Tories jumped on, they were probably aware that at some point the bottom was going to fall out of this story and that their source wasn't very strong. But the hope is that if you throw enough shit, some of it sticks, right? Um, which probably would have happened. Uh, but Corbyn has quite impressively really turned the table. So he's made this about the press. He's gone on the counterattack. And he said, we've had enough of a news media that lies to us. Um, and we're going to, when we're in government, rein in your power a little bit. Which doesn't mean any kind of censorship. It's about saying there are currently media monopolies which have way too much influence over our democratic process with no accountability. So what we need to do is make a model of the media sustainable where people can hear respectable voices as well, voices that don't just make up shit. Yeah, I mean, this is what I... I've got a piece coming out with uh, Navarra Media, my first column Mm. tomorrow. And actually, the, the tactics which are being used here by the mainstream media... Uh, slander, defamation, but also um, false ambiguity, false binaries, elision of critique. Like, this is what you would use in, this is effectively a propaganda war. This is the kind of counterinsurgency. I'm not even joking. If you read a book by a gentleman called Frank Kitson, he was in Burma, he was overseeing counterinsurgency methods in the final days of the British Empire. He perfected it in Burma, in Malaysia. He takes it to Northern Ireland in the mid-1970s. These are the precise same techniques that the British establishment used on its uh, colonies Mm. and on its possessions overseas, and now they're being used against the leader of the opposition. Now, that isn't new. Something similar happened with Howard Wilson. But Jeremy Corbyn isn't even a number 10 yet. I mean, this is a whole new level of effectively an apparatus which historically discredited uh, radicals abroad now coming home. Uh, and it's, uh, it's not terrifying because it's a complete disaster. It's kind of funny. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when you think of it in those terms, I mean, it's, this is just a taste of how the media would treat a Jeremy Corbyn government. But it is why you have to tackle it head on. So right. there were the centrist response on Twitter yesterday and today. So James Ball did a tweet which was saying like, these are actually all quite good policies. But the fact that he's uh, repeated them just after he was attacked tarnishes them because it makes it seem like it's revenge. But the point is, you can't pretend that the relationship between the Labour Party and the media is not political. If you pretend that this was just a mistake and then you announce you're reforming policies in a couple of weeks' time, the media win. Because they, when when they're at a stronger position, when they're out of the news, when they look less ridiculous, they can say, this is an attack on our freedom of speech. Whereas what you need to do is you need to say, actually, there is a struggle going on. There is a struggle going on, which is between oligarch-owned media, oligopoly, monopolies, against democracy, against having a proper, informed debate in Britain about what we want the country to look like. And we were talking about um, what would have happened had The Sun run this story, let's say, well, just over 12 months ago, 14 months ago. Uh, I think, the, for me, the nadir, the low point of the Corbyn leadership was probably January 2017. Just mm-hmm. because that was the month that Mark Fisher um, took his own life and it just felt very bleak. The weather was terrible. It just felt very bleak. The, you know, people were saying that, that Theresa May would get a majority of 200, all sorts of things. Uh, people on the left were saying that as well. Mm-hmm. And, not without, and not without substance. It wasn't just because they were, you know, um, running away with themselves. That was there in the polling. I, didn't think, I never thought things were that bad, but clearly things weren't particularly good. Well, it was also the period where they briefed they were going to do populism and then didn't yeah. actually do it. Yeah. Yeah, for me, the two low points have been basically the the period after the first leadership election. Again, that was kind of early 2016, the winter. And then similar process with the two by-elections as well last year in Mm -hmm. Stoke and in in Cumbria with Copeland. 
Um, but I do wonder how this story would have been processed differently had it come out 14 months ago or had it come out 20 months ago. And I think the big difference is that uh, the Labour right, the Melts, um, have broadly said nothing. If you look at Jess Phillips' Twitter feed, she has said nothing about this, mm -hmm. neither good nor bad. And I have a suspicion that was, were it to be 20 months ago, a couple of dozen of them would have piled in. And of course, that then gives this nonsense, this propaganda credibility, mm -hmm. because the public's perception is, well, the Sun's saying it, the Tories are saying it, and even Labour's saying it. So it must be true. And I think that's a really, really big change. What do you think? I think that's absolutely true. And it, yeah, no, I think that makes a big difference that no, no Labour MPs have piled, up, piled in. And the Tories that have piled in now have egg on their faces. Um, so Ben Bradley, Corbyn's launching legal action against him, which is brilliant. Uh, Andrew Neil on the Daily Politics today was really taking down the the Tory frontbencher who was was on the show to say, have have your colleagues just been completely bullshitting? Is there anything behind what they've actually, been saying actually, at all? Could we could we pull that up? The big man Gary, I'm going to say his name. Gary doesn't want to be named. Well, you're going to be named Gary. Uh, the, said, you know. Don't make me pull too many things up, but we're going to try this. We want to pull something up. Yeah, let's know. pull it up. Let's it's, just see how it works. I tweeted it today, Gary, so you can get it on thing. my. You can get it on my feed. It's a real. I mean, but this is the reason why I want to bring it up is because, like you say, look, Andrew Neil's a conservative. Okay, um, he was working for Murdoch in the late eighties. He was Murdoch's Rottweiler. Notwithstanding that, he also knows which way the wind is blowing. Mm -hmm. He's also very smart. He's very well read, and uh, when Andrew Neil is uh, reacting like that, I think it means something which is that the Tories are in absolute freefall. That this is an embarrassment. This is, really, this is really bad. This is an embarrassment for the establishment. Because they don't even have like Brexit anymore. Brexit is going to happen in 13 months. And actually, it looks like they're going to have to accept kind of Labour's position fundamentally. Mm -hmm. Unless Theresa May wants to stand down and then a hard Brexiteer replace her as So, so by that, you mean something that looks like the customs union? Yeah. We uh, basically leave the single market, but with... Uh, a lot of prioritised. Trade. We'll have an interim period after Brexit Day, which is in 13 months, right? Um, I think actually we're going to just go to this Andrew Neil thing now. Let's have a look. Let's see what Andy Neil did this morning, dropping heat on the daily politics. Entry. In what way? Well, the Defence Secretary's chosen his own words. I mean, the point for me about this debacle well, has is he that we believe... His country? Well, Jeremy Corbyn, I think, is a grave danger to this country, but that's because Has of the... Has he betrayed the country? That's because of the, the ideas in which he believes and what that would mean well, that, for our well, economy that, and that, our that's society. Fine. People have all sorts of ideas. But you're a defence secretary. Our defence secretary, the defence secretary of this government, of our government, has said the leader of Her Majesty's opposition has betrayed his country. In what way has he betrayed his country? Well, that it really is a question for Gavin Williamson. That's not the so word. So you don't agree with it? Well, I'm not, I'm not really commenting on the... Uh, well, do you think the... he's betrayed the country? I think that Jeremy Corbyn is a grave danger to our country. But that's a political it... point. That's a different... Of course you do. Everybody in one party thinks the other party's a grave danger. Betrayal is an entirely different matter. That's a serious accusation. I just point out that a senior figure of the Czech Republic Defence Ministry says Sarkozy, who is the former Czech spy, it's his real name, is a liar. That's the exact word. The director of the Czech Archives on Security says no files show Mr Corbyn cooperating with Czech intelligence. The German archivists say there are no Stasi files on Mr Corbyn at all. So I ask again, in what sense has Mr Corbyn betrayed this country? Well, Andrew, I'm not going to comment on that. As you've su suggested, this is uh, an area where there's lots of questions to answer. Well, We've got a free press in this country. The free press is asking the questions. They should be answered. Yeah, but you, it's not just the free press. Your fellow Tories are all piling in as a result. Your security minister, again, the key word security minister, he's compared Mr Corbyn to Kim Philby. Kim Philby was a traitor. At the time, if he'd been found guilty, he would have been hanged. That's an outrageous smear to say of the leader of the opposition. Well, Andrew, I'm not going to allow you to draw me into potentially libeling anybody, uh, and so I'm not going to comment on so that. So you don't agree with that either? So well, you I'm don't not... agree with the defence minister, you don't agree with the security minister? Well, this is classic dead cat strategy, isn't it? The government's on uh, the rope. Skewered. When you're being asked... Um, do you agree with your colleague? And then your response is, I don't want to libel anyone. <laughs> You're effectively saying, 
my colleagues are up shit creek and they're about to lose and i'm talking particularly to ben bradley here mm. and who's this other chap who actually said the kill kim philby comment uh, he's he's security minister I he's don't know on his slightly name. less thin ice i think because he made some sort of excuse up and it's still up there but i think ben bradley ben bradley i mean i'm not a lawyer mm. he's a security minister though the other one the one who's, who compared him to king philby I mean, you know these saying- aren't he was just saying, I wanted to add historical context, all this stuff. I mean, mm. I mean you, Ben Bradley, absolutely 100%, is going to have to go to court and is going to have to account for that. Delicious. It is delicious. It is delicious. But why is that quickly? Why, is Andy, why, why was Andy Neil playing it so hard there? Um, well, as we were just saying earlier, I mean, he is a smart guy. He's of conservative leanings, absolutely. Uh, but it seems like this story has unraveled to such a degree that it's... It's an embarrassment even to the establishment. There's, there's just no way that you can... So, so what's, hap- what's happened? Because obviously, look, they're good at this. They're good at smears. They've been doing it for decades. Why has this unfolded so badly, so quickly? Uh, well, I suppose the media were clutching at straws. And the media who are particularly partisan towards Theresa May, they can't attack Labour on policy. They can't defend May on policy. So they're going for bizarre smears now and they have to look in funny places as well because I think they're a bit shocked by how much they've thrown at Corbyn and how much it hasn't stuck so things are going to get more and more wild as we go on also do they not think that people have kind of baked this in I mean we saw this with Trump right the personal stuff just wasn't working with look Donald Trump needed effectively like Jeremy Corbyn Jeremy Corbyn needs to win a big majority Labour need 42 43 percent of the country right a decent majority clearly at the next general election, I can imagine. I can, I, I can even imagine fifty percent of the electorate mm. have baked that all in, and they don't care actually, and they're going to vote for Greens or Lib Dems or Jeremy Corbyn or the SNP even. Right? Th- there's a deeper point as well, actually. Whether it's do people have suspicions about his uh, foreign policy agenda, but bake it in, but say, oh, I recognise that, but I really like his economic policy, or do people actually respect the fact that he always had an independent relationship to global politics? So one of the reasons, one of the things that the Sun constantly try and fling at him was that he wasn't an uncritical nationalist. So he took the Republican side in the Irish conflict seriously. You know, so, it's, so they, they want to smear him just for the fact of speaking to Republicans, which is the same as Matthew Dancona. He was like, why was he even speaking to this Czech diplomat? So there's, there's this idea that you might want to hear the other side of the story being inherently suspicious. And... I think it seems that people don't don't buy that. We don't have this idea that Britain were always perfect, and we know that Margaret Thatcher allied with people like Pinochet. I mean, on the on the IRA thing, Jeremy Corbyn uh, met uh, representatives of Sinn Fein in the Houses of Parliament very shortly after the Brighton bombing, in regard to uh, the human rights of Irish prisoners in the UK legal justice system in the prison system. Those are human rights. Of course a politician has to talk about them. Of course they have to try and address them. Mm. We're talking about political prisoners. Now, if you think that's beyond the pale for a progressive, actually even for any politician, quite frankly, that they simply shouldn't talk about those things, then actually, as a journalist, you shouldn't be writing in a democratic country because you don't like democratic values. But anyone can write in a democratic country, Aaron, can't they? Well, I mean, but this is the thing. But this is the, I mean, this is the, sh- the sort of... the. the, the the converse of this is that they say we want a free press, but at the same time we don't want politicians who want to protect human rights of political prisoners in the British prison system. Uh, of course it's hypocrisy, but that's all these people do. Mm-hmm. Anything else? I think we're done on spies and Corbyn. No, I, I wanted, there was one more thing. There was the, the Finkelstein, the Danny Finkelstein piece. Oh, OK, yeah, this is good. Lord Finkelstein. Can we pull this up uh, in the Times? Um it was interesting in so much as... Um, uh, it's completely 100% false? Well, no, it's false. But then Danny Finkelstein <laughs> added that the, the sort of variant of socialism to which Jeremy Corbyn has always subscribed, the peace movement, internationalism, never really enamoured with Moscow, mm. um, doesn't fit with this misrepresentation of him. Yes, there are some people in the Labour Party today that may apply to... It applies to David Aronovich, for instance, who's now one of his leading critics, used to be in the Communist Party. Here we go. Um, And, you know, Jeremy Corbyn was signing parliamentary motions in the late 1980s, criticising the Stalinist bureaucracy of the Czechoslovak government and supporting striking workers, you know, similar with Solidarnosc, similar with the DDR, with the Soviet Union. What he said was that what we, this needs, the breakdown of these regimes now needs to be an opportunity for real socialism, which it wasn't. 
Uh, and I think we probably both agree with that. Yeah, this is absolutely. not a niche position. There was there was a really good quote in the in the Guardian piece on this where, where Jan Kavan, who was I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, so he was the foreign minister and deputy prime minister after the fall of the Iron Curtain. So from 1969 to 1989, he was a leading dissident in exile. So he'd been in exile since the Prague Spring. He was someone who wanted to democratise. Since 68, right? Uh, well, he was in exile from 69. 69, okay. But, so I a mean, long time. 68 happened then. Yeah. Um, so that's oh, 20 years. Yeah. But he considered Corbyn a good friend. Um, the two spoke at length when the leader visited Prague. So Corbyn was a friend of Czech dissidents. He wasn't an apologist for an authoritarian regime. And Kavan said of the allegations, you have to take... You have to take it not just with a pinch of salt, but a wagon load of salt. He added, it's a classic smear campaign. It's clearly designed to weaken Jeremy Corbyn's position. So that's from a, a Czech dissident, not from anyone who was involved in the pro-Soviet regime. Not Michael Walker at Navarra Media. Czech dissident, expelled after the, the Prague Spring. Exactly. But this, this Finkel standpoint, I want to stick with. Because it's it's remarkable how many Tories like Ben Bradley or how many people in the media even like a, a Seb Payne at the at the Financial Times this Matthew Dancona piece in the Guardian what well, that was okay this Matthew Dancona piece in the Guardian and it's remarkable how few of them will actually be aware of this stuff how there are a variety of left traditions how after the Hungarian uprising after the Prague Spring there were many forks in the road where people took different directions and actually they weren't backing Moscow. After 1945, Moscow effectively loses Yugoslavia as it is its sphere of influence. So, I mean, really, the historical illiteracy of these people almost matches their ineptitude in underpinning a successful smear campaign, which they failed to do. Well, there's also no recognition of the fact that blind loyalty to the United States in the Cold War was a morally reprehensible position. Right, Vietnam. Yeah. Right. Well, but a bunch of places. No, but I mean, I mean, that's the most, that's yeah, the yeah, most that's visceral the, in our culture, right? The most visceral. Think one. like, um... but supporting the overthrow of democracy in Chile. I mean, Thatcher supported that more directly by being good pals with Pinochet. But this kind of stuff, where in the history books, even in I sometimes teach A level history, even in A level history, you learn that there were two sides to the Cold War, yeah, and that you can't take, you can't just see the West as the good guys and the East as the bad guys. Yeah. And if anyone was speaking to a member of the Eastern Bloc, consider that completely suspicious. You know, this is, it's a Cold War ideology that doesn't really have credence anymore. But Tory MPs, and I think that's why, the, why it's not sticking. And, but Tory MPs and, and these journalists are sticking with it. Of all the people to, to cite in this conversation, I'm going to bring up Anne Coulter. Mm. And she says that Anne Coulter, if people don't know, is obviously she's kind of very right wing uh, commentator in the US. Uh, in many ways, I think the most talented because she, she nails things in a certain way quite succinctly. And I remember her saying this when Trump was being pinned down with all this Russia stuff. She said, Americans don't care about Russia. You know mm. why? Because we won the Cold War. They don't care. We won. Move on. Next story. So there's no sense of um, anger of grievance you won the cold war why are you still talking about moscow why are you trying to dress vladimir putin up as nikita khrushchev mark ii it's not going to work because on the one hand you're saying this on the other hand such an integral part of our political culture is the west is so great we beat these guys well if we beat them then how the hell are they such a threat and uh i mean she was right because trump won and the russia stuff still whatever you think about it isn't sticking i mean it's polling after his State of the Union address, I think went up slightly. So, yeah, I don't. I mean, I, I, I don't know who thinks this stuff works. It's a waste of time, which is great. I mean, this, this, this shit ain't sticking. Do you think that the Corbyn project thrives in adversity? That actually they've done him a favour. Uh, I think there's, I th there's, there's two answers to this question. So it does thrive in these moments, but whether or not it can sustain itself on moment after moment after moment after moment until the next general election is a different question. So I think even though some some onlookers have been a bit disappointed that things have been a bit quiet over the last couple of months, so there isn't the same kind of anti-establishment fights that we saw during the general election. Mm. I've been one of them. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I think it's a legitimate position. But the argument is, is that sustainable for four years? Or is it better for in this period, you're sort of trying to reassure people, you're trying to broaden your base, you're trying to build up new allies and new constituencies, even if it is with seemingly incredibly boring policies like 50 things to do with your pet 
I can't 50, The 50 point plan for 50, pets. 50 you point like plan for pets. Pets. No, not at all, but. Well. Make it five. Why 50 points? 50, 50 is way too much. It's like, when, crazy, it's like when they did uh, about a thousand and one questions about Brexit or something. I remember when they launched that one. Uh, it, it maybe could have been done better. But what I'm saying is that if what you're doing doesn't get huge headlines for the next year, considering we're in a, a low point in an electoral cycle anyway, sort of building a bit of a narrative where you reassure people, where you flesh out your economic policy a little bit. And I'm not sure if you can sustain taking on the establishment every week for four years. I mean, I... I think do it when you have to, and I think yeah, I had to this week. I mean, I wrote in 2016, I said the new laws of politics kind of thing about after Trump won and after Brexit. And I said, in the new politics, either you're on the front foot or you're on the back foot. Mm. And I believe that. I don't think there's a standing still in politics at the moment. So if you look at the SNP, for instance, there's the referendum, 2014, huge breakthrough in the general election the following year, in May 2015. And... Uh, they sort of stood still Mm. and it doesn't work. Uh, It doesn't work because we're in a moment of profound economic and political crisis. We're in a moment of declining media. We're in a moment of consent really being withdrawn from our system, even amongst Tories, even amongst people that will never vote Labour or Jeremy Corbyn. They are losing consent in the status quo. Now that means they either go to UKIP or they don't vote or they go to the Lib Dems or, you know, they'll carry on voting the Tories, but they really hate doing it. But really, very, very, very few people are actually happy with the system as it is. So I do think that kind of static, I can understand why you'd want to do it. I mean, it's very tempting. But I think to do it for uh, years, I think would be a huge mistake. Mm. And that's why I think that this has almost been a gift to Jeremy Corbyn. I mean, what is true is that people hate the press. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that people have no respect and no trust for these guys. So when... They try and get all hand-wringing about, oh, he's attacking our... No one thinks the Sun are a neutral Mm. arbiter in politics being unfairly attacked. Everyone knows they're a hyper-partisan organisation with zero scruples and who are very inclined to lie. (laughs) So taking on... They are one of the most... What was great about yesterday is the two headlines were Jeremy Corbyn takes on bankers and Jeremy Corbyn takes on the media. I mean, That's that's it, right? That's perfect. That's no it. one likes those guys for good reason. A final point on this story. I remember doing, um, I was doing probation. Mm. Uh, actually, just before it was outsourced to Serco in London. And I was in South London with a bunch of, uh, it was mostly young, younger black guys uh, because n- nobody had done anything particularly serious. There were also some women who'd done driving offences. And again, they were all black. And the point is, if you're a white person who doesn't, you know, mm. does something naughty while you're driving, you don't do this, right? You just get a slap on the wrist. So that was pretty amazing just as, a, as an experience in terms of the racialization of the criminal justice system. But I remember one, there was one day when uh, one of the guys came in, one of the gaffers came in, and he put the sun, and it was two Jamaican men actually, and he put the sun down on the paper, uh, the, the newspaper, the sun down on the, on the table. And uh, my heart sank, and I thought, oh my God, they're reading the sun, yada, yada, yada. It's just all these young boys just joking, go, this is a lot of like bullshit. Mm. Ha ha, lol, this is funny. People don't go to this. And this is what I don't like with the left. They go, we need to persuade these people through the sun. Nobody reads the sun for their political views, actually. Mm. That's why so many sun readers at the last general election voted Labour. They go for the football. They go because it's literally, it's peanuts. It costs like 20p or something. Uh, they go for a bit of a laugh and a bit of an escape and something to read on the bus or on their tea break. They're not going, Trevor Kavanagh says this in the sun, you know, I'm going to agree with them. It may be part of a broader ecology where it confirms other things they're hearing and reading. Sure, I'm not saying it's unimportant, but in and of itself as a kind of form of political opinion, I think it's really, really, really overestimated. Now more than ever, right? Right. So, right, we're going to move on to the big business today, the main business. Jordan Peterson and communist lobsters. So, uh, Jordan Peterson, who is he, Michael? Well, actually, he he doesn't think lobsters were communist. Just uh, just to, just to clarify, <laughs> he he thinks lobsters were deeply deeply hierarchical, uh, and and lived in a very unequal society. But anyway, who is he? He's a Canadian psychologist uh, who is I don't know if he is anymore, but for a very long period of time, he was number one on the U.S., Canadian, and U.K. book charts with his book Twelve Rules for Life, which is a self help guide, which we've both been reading, which mixes biblical stories with Evolutionary biology and... And psychology, right? And psychology and then quite a lot of anti-communism. And basically, you no know, sociology or politics. We'll talk about that in a second. If maybe Gary can get this up, you can see this guy's book on Amazon. 
um, 12 Rules of Life, An Antidote to Chaos or something. Exactly, yeah. So the, the general theme is that you it's sort of aimed at young men. And the idea is that to be to live a good life, you need to have some self-discipline. You need to have some purpose. You need to get up at the right time. You need to eat well. Um, and you need to act strong. Then people will respect you. Um, and you need to forego immediate pleasures for long-term achievements. It's £13.60. Uh, yeah, it's a big book. And it's only in hardback, right? And um, I think it's 450 pages. Is it? I downloaded it. It's a big, it, so I... big book. I mean, I was just listening to it on Audible. Um, so I've, I went through about half of it mm. just in a couple of hours. Um, it's a big, big book. And you think, I can understand, you know, a book the size of capitalist realism. When I was talking to Versa about doing this fully automated luxury communism book, they were saying, let's do a pamphlet because that's what's going to sell. That's the presumption. But actually what Jordan Peterson's done here is it's a self-help book, but it's, you know, 450 pages. It's like reading Hegel or something. And actually the prose, as you'll know, can be quite thick and turgid at points. Well, it's, I mean, in obviously we'll get onto the politics of it, but just the fact of that this is the most selling book and also that Joe Rogan and those podcasts, which are two and a half hours of just a conversation um, about quite serious, significant topics. I mean, it's often wrong, obviously, um, but it is quite counterintuitive, especially to what people have been expecting um, in the recent media landscape, which is that you have to make things short, snappy, uh, very quick to the point. Um, whereas, yeah, it turns out there is actually quite a large audience for very discursive, long-winded... <laughs> I mean, it's all quite easy to understand. It doesn't... You don't have to have read anything else to read it, which is what's quite... One of the reasons it's quite popular. So people on the left... Um, so I was reading uh, an article by Shuha Haider from Viewpoint, sort of critiquing it because he'd... It, it was a misreading of Derrida or he hadn't really bothered reading Derrida but the whole point of Jordan Peterson is that to read it you don't have to have read anything else it gives you sort of like these introductions to different schools of thought which makes sense <clears> to people because they do exist as tendencies kind of in the world even okay. if they're misattributed we're, we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves we we're, getting talking, ahead of we're, ourselves. Talk, we're talking about Derrida and stuff like this um, I guess a good place to start for a British audience is the interview that he did with Kathy Newman on Channel 4 well this is where he got famous so, right. so and around the world he got famous basically from various shock moment yeah so in canada it was a controversy about a new law about trans rights which we're going to get to in britain it was this interview with kathy newman where she was trying to take him down she basically him, right? she was trying to skewer him and she failed um and this has over six million views now and this is what more well the last time i looked it was six million so even more now i think it's got a lot more maybe i'm wrong um so it's about tens of millions now now look I think it's like 32 million or something. I don't, want to, I don't want to misinform people, so it won't be the first But time. this this was the moment where the book went to number one in the UK yeah. charts. Not many people had heard of him before this. He was touring the UK at this point. I know he did a, spe uh, a speech. He was talking at Conway Hall, I think, in London. Mm. And he went on Channel 4 that day. He's back over here, actually, in May. I want to get him on. I'd love to get I him on. I want to challenge him on this stuff. 7.3 million views. 7.3 million. There's a video of him somewhere. Maybe, maybe that's the Joe Rogan video. Okay, anyway. On that note, we're going to go to the latter parts, the latter stages of that interview with Kathy Newman, particularly where they focus on the the neurotransmitters of lobsters and what it tells us about hierarchy. So let's let's see that. Right, that you hate to be compared to. You um, want to stir things up. I'm only a provocateur insofar as when I say what I believe to be true, it's provocative. I don't provoke. Maybe for humor. You don't set out now to and then. I'm not interested in provoking. But what Not about the, the thing about, you know, fighting and the lobster? Tell us about the lobster. <laughs> well, that's quite a segue. Well, the first chapter I have in my book is called Stand Up Straight With Your Shoulders Back. And it's an injunction to be combative. Um, not least to further your career, let's say. But also to adopt a stance of ready engagement with the world and to reflect that in your posture. And the reason that I write about lobsters, is because there's this idea that hierarchical structures are a sociological construct of the Western patriarchy. And that is so untrue that it's almost unbelievable. And I use the lobster as an example, because the lobster, we, we div divulged from lobsters in evolutionary history about 350 million years ago, common ancestor. And lobsters exist in hierarchies, and they have a nervous system attuned to the hierarchy. 
And that nervous system runs on serotonin, just like our nervous systems do. And the nervous system of the lobster and of the human being is so similar that antidepressants work on lobsters. And it's part of my attempt to demonstrate that the idea of hierarchy has absolutely nothing to do with sociocultural construction, which it doesn't. Let me just get this straight. You're saying that we should organize our societies along the lines of the lobsters. I'm saying that it's inevitable that there will be continuity in the way that animals and human beings organize, organize their structures. It's, it's it absolutely inevitable. And there is one third of a billion years of evolutionary history behind that. So that's, I mean, that's really interesting, right? He's, um, he's using evolutionary biology uh, as a defense for quite reactionary politics. And that's new. That's new. I mean, you get the historical racists at the end of the 19th century, but it's bad science, right? That's the thing with um, Spengler or uh, Lombroso in Italy, the sort of basis of, you know, white supremacy is justifiable that it's a white man's burden because these people are racially superior. What he's now saying is, well, actually, hierarchy is inevitable. You need it in societies and it's an outgrowth of nature. And actually, it's hundreds of millions of years old. It even precedes primates. And... I thought that the the problem with that conversation was, I mean, we're going to agree, you're always going to have hierarchies. Um, even anarchists would say you have some forms of hierarchy. For instance, you have representation through delegates. The point is they're recallable. The point is it's democratic. Or they would say there's a hierarchy on basis of competence. A doctor can operate on you because they're a doctor, whereas a mechanic can't. Uh, so you're always going to have hierarchies, but it's about democratic oversight, um, their ability to compel other people to do things. And i that's just completely absent in what he's saying. I mean, humans have always had hierarchies, but God, the hierarchy of, you know, uh, hunter-gatherers 12,000 years ago on the savannah obviously looks completely different to that of Donald Trump as president of the United States. Well, I think what's, what's happened in that interview, and this is quite common for Jordan Peterson, and it's why it would have been... I think if you went with the right preparation, you could take him on, on on these things, which is he's he's basically built up a straw man and who's got quite a ridiculous position, which is there was no hierarchy before patriarchy and capitalism. And therefore, if we get rid of both of them, we'll get rid of hierarchy. That's the argument he's he's seemingly arguing against. And he's saying because there is a human nature, it's not unmalleable, but there are some sort of constants that will exist within it. I think that's true. I mean, I think you can use evolutionary biology to sort of like derive some insights about how we behave. I don't think you can get any sort of moral justification for anything from it. But do you not think the, I mean, there is an answer which says nature isn't just? Well, that's the point. We're not purely biological animals. We're also, you know, whether it's in Pico della Miranda or Shakespeare or Pope, you know, humans are somewhere between the, the dust and between the angels. The point is we're sentient and we can reflect on our social situations, which are dynamic and they constantly change, and we can try and shape them in ways which we think are more just, right? Nobody thinks that, for instance, universal equality or equality under the law is an outgrowth of biology. We just think that's a, a pretty good way to run society because if you were X person, then you would want it to be run like that too. No, but what I think what the argument he's making is that we can learn, and this is what I mean, he's, he's, cho he's chosen a very easy target. He's chosen a very easy target, which is sort of like potentially a non-existent, but some sort of, basically US campus politics is who he's targeting it at. And you do get this tendency from, from some political movements and arguments, which is that everything is socially constructed. There isn't really a human nature. Oppression is something that we learn from capitalism. Competition is something that we learn from capitalism. And he's saying, actually, it goes deeper than that. And whatever society you build, you're going to have some, you're going to have many competitive individuals who are seeking some sort of status over each other. I mean, that's all he says in that clip there. I mean, if, if you read deeper into it, it's a much more inherently conservative uh, doctrine, basically because he thinks, he, he tries to characterise everything that's not the status quo as that kind of totalitarian desire to remove right. all inequality. I mean, this is, um, Mark Fisher talks about this in Capitalist Realism, right? He talks about, um, because there is so little to offer under neoliberalism, that the establishment try to construct consent on anti-utopianism. Mm -hmm. So what I think Jordan Peterson is appealing to there is, you can't change the status quo, things will always be bad, and actually it's an outgrowth to some extent of our, our natural inclinations and of biology. And like you say, and we'll get onto this in a second, any attempt to do so actually will always 
will always be negative. And I think this is this is important because conservative ideology fundamentally can accept the possibility of change, but it says it has to be slow and it has to happen when it works. Reactionary ideology actually wants to reverse society back to a former state of affairs. So arguably you could say conservatism, it's possibly a modern ideology. Angela Merkel is actually a conservative, you know. She wants to change things very incrementally. Uh, I think Jordan Peterson is a reactionary because he's seeking to say that actually many aspects of our modern social settlement are born out of this era and actually we need to go back. That's why I say that this whole evolutionary psychology thing, he's trying to basically prop up, I think, I think an anti an anti enlightenment politics and a politics mm. literally w which would precede the French and American revolutions. If you take his arguments to their logical conclusion, Feudal feudalism fundamentally, divine right of kings, things like this. Well, it depends. I mean, I, it's quite vague. I think it's, it's it's left quite vague. I mean, it, it, on on the most basic level, it's a sort of. Well, no. But if you say politically, the centre of my politics is hierarchy is natural. I mean. That does lend itself to... Yeah, I mean, if you, if you give that a central place in your politics, which he does, and but that's because he's made this weird enemy... He's sort of made up this enemy of someone who wants no hierarchy, so he's treating it like there's either hierarchy or no hierarchy, and there isn't a discussion of different levels of hierarchy or democratic hierarchy or non-democratic hierarchy. So he's, he's counterposing basically the status quo with something completely bizarre that not actually many people are fighting for. So that's why he's... And that's why it's so slippery. Right. So that was the, the Cathy Newman... What did you think of that interview, by the way? Because it was quite long in the end, wasn't it? it was yeah. 30 minutes. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the, the interview was... That was the first I'd seen of Jordan Peterson was from that interview. And he didn't say anything as shocking as I was expecting. Because it's... I mean, he, he, he wasn't really pushed to the logical conclusion of any of his arguments where it gets really conservative. So he was generally talking against a a straw man, which is and the, always the, quite a lazy place to be. The form of from. argumentation that Cathy Newman took. Now, look, the book's 450 pages. She probably didn't read much of it. She probably just watched a few videos. Fine. But this kind of skewering, clearly, actually, it's very counterproductive with mm -hmm. somebody like him. When I saw that interview, I don't know if you feel the same, it really, it just really hit me that the left has to get their shit together when it comes to um, criticising and confronting the ideologues of the radical right, which he is a member of. I don't think he's a fascist, but I think he's clearly on the radical right. He's, like I said, I think he probably has a reactionary politics. And there's this default thing where it's just like, call somebody a fascist, call somebody a white supremacist, and that's it. Mm. You're not winning the argument. Guess what? Politics is about persuasion. You're not persuading anybody. And it's not so bad in this country. But some of the stuff you see in the US is, I mean, it's batshit. And it's, you're only going to lose. You're only going to lose. That doesn't mean you'd stop debating fascists or Tommy Robinson. And by the way, I define a fascist as somebody in a fascist organisation. Okay, that's a good place to start. But most people don't care less about politics. They don't know about the history of lobsters. They don't know about the French Revolution. They're going to listen to Jordan Peterson. He looks calm. He looks articulate. He's an older man, so he has all the, the associations in our culture that we, we, we see as congruent with authority and legitimacy. And they're going to take his argument over yours. That's life. So we need to start doing something about it. So if anything, I want Jordan Peterson to shake the left out of this, elements of the left out of this kind of laziness. So that it has to make arguments. We have to yeah. argue our position, otherwise we lose. Because the left clearly isn't winning in terms of stopping his voice getting heard, given that it's the most bought book in the UK, the US and Canada. And they're some of the most watched videos on YouTube. Right. You, ca you can't just ignore it. We can't ignore it. And we can't be like, huh, I mean, we, we've done it today because it's kind of funny, the lobster communism thing. People go, huh, the lobster guy. I mean, it's kind of a really fucking weird way of <laughs> making his argument. But... No, he's he's a relatively intelligent reactionary. Actually, we have to confront that quite quite constructively. Next video we're going to go is I think it's on Ontario where he teaches, right? Or is it Toronto? Uh, Ontario. Ontario. I, I've never been to Canada. Uh, Nick Cernak's from Canada. Best thing about Canada, Nick Cernak. Hey, it's Toronto. Oh, it's Toronto. It's from Toronto. Good. So we're going to go to this video, and this kind of propelled him actually as a bit of an internet star about a year ago, and he's being confronted by. Uh, trans activists, 
a range of activists, I think, who, who I think it seems tried to basically shut down one of his events. So let's have a look at that. That you that's why that was. I'm perfectly aware of I have a calm, rational question. Okay. I won't get emotional with you. Um, so, uh, who is this legislation harming? Who is harming it? anybody who wants to use their own words? So, in what in what capacity? Be, be specific. Look, it's important that people are able to use their own words. Okay. Because that's how we think. And so, if the government starts legislating how we think... And so if I wanted to call you like, she... Hey, look, you if, no, no, I'm, I'm playing off of what you're saying. If I wanted to call you she and her and miss, because I that's my freedom of speech, and, and if everyone just called you that all the time, and that was the only thing... Can't you, can you tell? I, I think that you think that you don't care because you've never had to face that. And it's a common trend among people who have never had to face uh, like transgender-related discrimination that you think it's not a big deal because you don't have to deal with it. I didn't say I didn't think it was a big deal. I said I didn't care if people called me that. Public institutions, but it does prevent us from accessing health care. It does prevent us from accessing other services. I'm not, I'm not arguing about your rights. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I have a question for you. Yeah. Do you realize that right now, if you were to kill a trans person, because. I mean, this is interesting, right? Because she was talking about the pronouns and then the second that somebody interjected with like an economic argument about, oh, they, they talk about that, by the way, in that video. It's about, oh, rights to housing, access to X, Y, Z, material economic resources. He's like, he doesn't know what to talk mm -hmm. about because his ground is civil and political rights and freedom of speech. It also wasn't in that particular, it's, it's later in that clip, I think, where he does slip up and he gets... A little bit nervous after that, actually, because they, he's been trying to make out. Oh, we has, haven't. We actually haven't really introduced the issue, have we? Yeah, go on. This so is... this was. So this is Jordan Peterson. Like many people on on the new right, get famous through a series of controversies. So Jordan Peterson here was that interview with Kathy Newman, where she got quite a lot of abusive tweets afterwards. But that kind of helped Jordan Peterson because it made it into a news story. Uh, this was how he got famous in Canada, which was opposing. A bill which was going to include trans rights within their version of the Human Rights Act. And C-17, right? C-17. And he'd read into this that this is going to make it illegal for me to... This is going to make it a legal requirement that I refer to anyone or that anyone refers to anyone by their favoured pronoun. And he's saying this isn't about... And his argument is constantly, this isn't about the rights of... I'm not interested in attacking the rights of trans people. What I'm saying is we, this is a freedom of speech issue and, I sh and a person shouldn't be made to say Z or Z if they, if they don't want to. That shouldn't be the law. But what happens in this, which is, I mean, wh when, it's, when, when it's on freedom of speech, that's always when they're at their strongest, in a way. Um, but they asked him, would you refer to me as they or them? And he was like, no, I wouldn't. So it's, so it's not about freedom of speech. It's that he's ideologically opposed to anyone to having to recognize anyone as non-binary as someone who doesn't feel comfortable also like it's just the, it's the it's a problem with the english language is we don't really use the impersonal third person very often right and no no i'm just saying in many languages so like this mm. idea it's obviously just can, much of that of his argument i wouldn't use they well actually formally in some languages you would have to use something equivalent to they um especially if you're speaking to somebody older than you and I mean, it's just, and let me get this, this is up from the National Review. It sort of clarifies, I think, what he's saying and how, I mean, incredibly strange it is. He says, quote, I will never use words I hate, like the trendy and artificially constructed words. I mean, all words are artificially constructed. G and Zer, is that how you say it? Yeah. I'm not sure. Um, Z and Zer. That's how it's spelt here. These words are the vanguard of a postmodern radical leftist ideology that I detest, and which is, in my professional opinion, frighteningly similar to the Marxist doctrines that killed at least 100 million people in the 20th century. Now, that's a big jump. <laughs> that's a big jump going from pronouns. And again, it's about, we're saying about either hierarchy, no hierarchy, false binaries. Mm -hmm. Either I'm for these new pronouns or I'm not. And if I'm for them, it means that I'm also in favour of gulags and hundreds of millions of people being killed. Yeah, it's bizarre. Um, so how, how how has that got so much traction amongst otherwise amongst some people who are otherwise rational? Um, well, because if so it's, it's quite a seductive argument. Isn't well, it, if it's right? framed as um, you will be by law forced to call someone by whatever pronoun they choose that day, 
um, then yeah, it does seem like that would be a bit of a ridiculous law. I mean, but what the what the activists were saying there is they were saying we don't want to be called Z or Z. We want to be called they. We we agree with you that we can't just mandate you to completely change your language in a way that's completely unnatural to you and has no sort of social context surrounding it. Yeah. But they said that's why we use they in Shakespeare. They is used as a singular. You know, this this has a history in yeah. our language. Yeah. And at the same time, so then also a bunch of lawyers came in. So this was a huge debate in in Canada. So their association of the bar came in and said this won't be criminalizing anyone for just misgendering someone once or twice it's if you do it consistently in a way that's intended to harm someone like using the n-word yeah right which is um, hate, which is hate speech already yeah so and i don't know like i don't know like that term hate speech i think it's just because it's a very slippery term but i mean it clearly should be a criminal offense yes and but he's trying to make it out that that's not what's up for debate so that that's how you become a controversialist really is you take something where on one one very specific interpretation of of that law, yeah. it seems intuitively like a bad law. Well, it's a bit like the Gender Recognition Act, right, in this country, a bit. So, I mean, people have a variety of opinions on it, but what people obviously focus on is, okay, well, trans men in prisons, uh, or trans, sorry, trans women in prisons. I think most people agree trans men shouldn't be in, I mean, I wouldn't want to put them in a place where they could be sexually assaulted. Um, but that seems to be the focus, actually. That, the trans men thing is almost ignored, while we put trans women into women's prisons. And this is, you know, we're talking about pretty small numbers of people here. And yet it's coming to define a debate which affects, you know, I don't know how many people well, self-identify as non-binary or trans in this country, but you, you're talking about hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a similar thing, right? Yeah, well, it's similar in, in the same way that there was a particular interpretation of that law, which people who were opposed to it could make it seem like a really bad law. So the fact that, that what they... In Britain, what they've sort of clung on to is this idea of self-identification. And what they've said is, look, it seems completely unreasonable that someone can just say, I'm a woman, and then have the same rights as a woman to go into all women's spaces, which have been hard fought and won. And, you know, like, there's, women definitely have a right to all women's spaces. Um, but what it sort of ignores is that it's not actually that easy to just say, I'm a woman. You know, you, I, I, one of the best arguments I read about this was someone who was a, I can't remember her name, um, t- trans lawyer, but she was saying it's actually really difficult to change all of your details to, to a woman or to a man if you're if you're a woman already. Yeah. You need you need to get a new passport. You need to get all these all these new different forms of identification, even if it's not medically, um, sort of categorized as it is now. So now you have to live as a trans person for two years and your doctor has to sign off that you've that, that's how you get gender recognition yeah. whereas what the current proposals in the gender recognition act are is that to get to be recognized as of a certain gender you have to self-declare but that doesn't just mean you wake up in the morning and say yeah i'm a woman you know right you have to, which is the sort of this that, is the, there's, there's a bureaucratic process yeah. to go through which which does give it some social and also work. there's like a significant social stigma attached right I mean, trans people are amongst the most abused people. I mean, in terms of their legal rights, they're often not fulfilled. They're obviously subject to sexual assault, uh, significantly higher amongst, you know, I think amongst the LGBTQ community, they're significantly more likely mm. to be sexually assaulted. You know, murders of black trans women in the US are huge. Um, the murder rate's huge, suicide rate's huge, mental health problems. It's so, like the idea that somebody's just going to one day do this. I mean, again, it's very far-fetched. Anyway, enough of that. Um, why does he think this is Marxist? Well, this is what I don't understand. Karl Marx never talks about gender pronouns. So why does um, Jordan Peterson think this has anything to do with the guy who was a political economist? So he sees Marxism... This is all about hierarchy again. So he's saying that Marx saw any inequality as something to be abolished. So, But for Marx, it was inequality between the classes. And in the process of trying to abolish that inequality you destroy individualism tradition and then society breaks down and you end up with gulags that's his argument right um he says that when marxism went out of fashion in the 1960s it failed right basically he says when it fails postmodernists replace capitalist and proletariat with oppressed and oppressor yeah and it's hard to draw the relationship between this and, and trans right but so you get from You have oppressed and oppressor, and people see that any distinction between these two... Well, one, he's saying that Derrida sees any 
categorization of anything as sort of like a power relation. So the the idea that there are men and women is born out of men oppressing women. Right. So any binary category that we keep um, will be inherently oppressive. Right. And so we have to remove all difference um, because categorization is violent, basically. And so he sees this as part of that process of trying to right. remove all difference between people so, and so get to equality of outcome because I mean I was listening we're going to go to the Joe Rogan podcast in a sec where he's talking we won't talk it won't include the bit that I'm about to reference he says that basically the the kind of economic Marxism was completely proven he says it went out of fashion in the 60s and 70s and it was replaced by cultural Marxism postmodernism by the way cultural Marxism great article on this in the Guardian is a light motif of fascism again I don't believe that Jordan Peterson is a fascist I just don't think he's very well read on this stuff and I think probably many of his intellectual sources, you could say, are either fascists or themselves sources for fascism. Um, so the idea of cultural Marxism was that basically the Frankfurt School, many Jews, by the way, uh, leave Europe under the threat of Nazi tyranny. They go to the US. Walter Benjamin obviously dies, but people like Adorno, Horkheimer, they go to the US and they basically say, well, look, we can't win the economic battle. So what we need to do is win a culture war which brings people round to our view, which is, this is so mad, which is white men, white wealthy men are the enemy because that's always the enemy under capitalism. And therefore we're going to reorient this around a kind of cultural struggle rather than an economic one. And then they start talking about Gramsci and they all talk about Gramsci. They're all obsessed with Gramsci as well as the Frankfurt School. Mm. And they say, well, actually they understood that to change society, which Gramsci you know, does say in, in their defence, to change society, you need to change the common sense and the prevailing ideas uh, rather before you change the economic relations of production. Um, so people like Jordan Peterson, he buys into all of that, right? Mm. Steve Bannon, and this is why he's a fellow traveller of these people. Steve Bannon buys into all that. Andrew Breitbart buys into all that. Alex Jones buys into all of that. And many members of the KKK will buy into that. So when we're talking about kind of set of fellow travellers on the far right, and like I say, repeat, Jordan Peterson's not a fascist. He agrees with them on a number of things. And in fact, it, it singly, uh, I think, is probably the most important factor in his analysis of the left. Very, very, very similar to fascists. Mm. And again, it has nothing to do analytically. This is the article here. Great article. Um, analytically has nothing to do with Marxism. How can you say Marxism has been disproven in the last 10 years? Uh, wages are going down in this country, productivity flat, and the US home ownership back to 1965 levels. Um, uh, technology, you know, today Jeff Bezos announces the Culture Series, it's about a post scarce utopia, will be a series on Amazon. The man's worth $120 billion based on basically precarious low pay workers mixed with high technology. Clearly, the system isn't working, and, you know, some people happen to think that Marx actually has a pretty good handle on why inequality gets bigger over time which he concedes actually is a problem. Well, I mean, the, f the thing he really needs to do is like chill out about these things. Because <laughs> that whole cultural Marxism idea, I mean, obviously it's, it's not just an accidental mistake they've made, but it's t to see left-wing politics or to see any opposition to the status quo, whatever that, that is, as one, a pathology and two, a conspiracy. So, well, that's good. So Jordan Peterson sees any sort of... Uh, any drive for more equality as resentment, any disquiet with the status quo as as resentment, and he sees resentment as a bit of a pathology, he's a psychologist, and then anything he sees from people he believes to be to the left of him, he reads as part of this grand conspiracy to impose complete equality of outcome on everyone in the world. And he thinks that that process, which might happen innocuously... It is kind of Alex Jones' via, theory, right? uh, social democratic politician yeah. or by a TV series on Netflix. He thinks this is all people ultimately who are trying to impose complete equality of opportunity on everyone because they believe that oppression and hierarchy can and must be abolished as the number one priority over everything else. I mean, the thing about pathology is really important. So he's a psychologist, like you say. But um, Durkheim, Emil Durkheim, 19th century sociologist, he creates, well, he helps create this idea of sociology, which says that social facts aren't just the accumulation of uh, private interests and the agency of individuals. Social facts are actually things which can be measured almost as objective. That's mm. why we have social science. And they're distinct. They're not just the accumulation of psychological needs and desire. 
uh, there's something much broader. And it's almost like Jordan Peterson is saying that sociology doesn't exist or that political science can't exist or why would this population in this time and place have the grievances that they have? They may be justified. Instead, like you say, it's about it's really based on the individual and the fact that any dissensus with the status quo reflects uh, you know, an unhealthy personality. Mm-hmm. Which in a way, it's kind of interesting because this is how many late 19th century far-right people saw things. And yet it's very nicely aligned with the self-help culture of neoliberalism. Yeah, exactly. Which is why this book's doing so well, I think. It's, I mean, because that would be the question to ask him. Is, is sort of like, what would you have said to black people in 1960s America? Would you have said, stop trying to overcome segregation and Jim Crow? Look to yourself. Look how you can improve yourself. Yeah. Because there's no... Yes, sometimes maybe politics is driven by resentment and people haven't thought about what system they want to create, want to replace the current good, one good. with and maybe it's going to be worth. Maybe, maybe, that, is, good. Yeah. maybe that is the case. Yeah, I mean, that's often but, how things start. But right? how, do you, how do you adjudicate between those two things? If you, the moment you see someone rebelling, you dismiss them as resentful, as pathological and part of a grand conspiracy, then that's a pretty unscientific way to look at any grievance in the world. But this is the thing, the guy tries to pass himself off as ultra empirical, ultra rational, ultra scientific, and then he's just coming up with all manner of shibboleths, unevidenced, and like I say, this emphasis in psychology and pathology, uh, you know, he's getting rid of 150 years, basically, of of social science and sociology. And it's it's just super weird. And like you said, it's a really good, good point about, you know, where would you be in terms of LGBT struggles or women's struggles or... Well, he's, of, he specifically says at one point in the book that we, we made divorce uh we li- we liberalize divorce laws too soon too fast i mean there's, there's maybe an argument for that i'm not sure not liberalized but i mean there's maybe i mean society wasn't ready for um it was a huge shift in in i mean i think in sweden and look that that, that tells you it's not dysfunctional the fact that mm. the the highest rates of this stuff tend to be in wealthier countries with low income inequality pr- quite happy people but clearly something happens after, or maybe I suppose the counter argument is this was like a dam, right? And then actually this this new expanded understanding of personal freedom in the 1960s, yes, okay, it actually did get rid of thousands of years worth of presumptions around the centrality of the family. I mean, it did happen remarkably quickly. And I look at uh, women my, my, my mum's age, for instance, I know she always, she always struggled with her personal relationships with men because she didn't know what the expectations were. Mm. Um, and I think as a generation, we're quite lucky because men do have to do the things that women expect of them. You know, whereas I think my dad's generation, I mean, he's my dad's very good. But I think there was a there was a an interregnum period there where there was a lot of uncertainty around around gender roles. Um, but it was something that a lot of people fought for and that improved totally. a lot of people's lives as well, right? Oh, no, 100 percent. I mean, it's obviously an excellent thing to do. But I think, mm. you know, you're not going to go from thousands of years of patriarchy and the primacy of men in the family unit to you know universal gender equality it's just not going to happen because it's a huge social shift um but anyway let's go to this um joe rogan video where he talks about cultural marxism a little bit more because this is something we really we want to unpack because it shows just how much he is a, a bird of a feather with people like alex jones so let's have a look at that uh i haven't because people don't do it they don't ask me to do it but what is it about that idea or that ideology about Marxism that's so attractive to young students and to university professors? Oh, well, that's a good question. I think it goes back to the issue of inequality. And, and this is something that has to be dead seriously addressed. It's like, you might say, well, why is the left wing necessary? Let, let's, let's put it that way. And, so, and then a subset of that would be, well, why is the left wing attractive? Well, the left wing is necessary because inequality does spiral out of control. And so there has to be a political voice for the dispossessed. And you, you don't want people to stack up at zero, you know, where they can't play the game at all. It's a bad idea. Not only do you not, if people stack up at zero, they're too poor to get ahead at all, let's say. They're too poor to open a bank account. They're too poor to buy enough food. Like they're stuck at zero and they can't get out of it. It's a really bad scene because, first of all, that's a lot of suffering. And that's not so good. Second of all, well, at least in principle, a lot of those people might be, um, what, might have something to offer the world or their children might, and you want to open up avenues of opportunity to them so that they can succeed, but so that everyone else can benefit from their success. 
So, and then the next thing is, well, if the inequality gets out of hand too much, then the whole society starts to destabilize. Because if you get enough people stacked up at zero, especially young men, you get enough young men stacked up at zero, they think, oh, to hell with it, we'll just flip the whole board over, and it'll settle in a new configuration, and maybe we won't be stuck at zero in the new configuration. So it foments revolutionary thinking. So there's lots of reasons to be concerned about inequality. And so you need a voice on the left to say, look, we've got to parameterize the, the tendency towards inequality so that it doesn't destabilize the entire society, so that it's, everybody has an opportunity to advance. Like, yes, right, you need that. Okay, so that's the technical reason for the necessity of the left. And then I think it's attractive because, well, because young people can be resentful, partly because they're at the bottom of the heap, so to speak. They're not because they're young. Like, look, you want to be, you want to be poor in 18, you want to be rich in 80. Which are you going to choose? Most well, people are going to take poor at 18. They, well, yeah. <laughs> Especially if you've been rich at 80 and you understand you can get back there. Yeah, well, that's the thing, you know, is that most of the people who are, have a million dollars or more in the United States are old. Well, why is that? Well, <laughs> really, do we need an explanation for that? It's like, you've had... This is really stupid. This is really, really, really thick. So the idea that people have asset ownership just because they're older... I mean, look, in Britain, for instance, in the 1980s, you get uh, cheap council housing, you still have high wages, you can still get public pensions. If you were, let's say you were working in, the, in one of the public industries, which was privatized, you kept your old pension, you probably got some of the stock, you bought your house on the cheap. Then in the 1990s, your mortgage is nice and cheap. After There's a brief period where it's not because of high interest rates. Interest rates get cheap again. You pay off your mortgage, you've got your pension, you can then buy a second home, you can make loads of money. The political economy of asset ownership changes with falling wages, inability to access credit after the credit crunch, and house prices in Haringey average is 15 times the average wage. It wasn't that 30, 40 years ago. So this idea about asset ownership just being a function of age, of how old you are, it's fucking stupid. And again, it's a man that's trying to pass himself off as empirical and studious and a social scientist, this does not stack up as a remotely intelligent argument. Mark, I agree. Mark. I mean, again, I think it's this thing where he's he's doing a... He, he It's unclear who he's arguing with. So he's arguing with someone with a completely ridiculous position which probably doesn't even exist. And he's never... He's, he says on that Joe Rogan thing that he's never actually debated a, a Marxist. He doesn't seem to debate left-wing people because then they'd probably say, that's not actually what, we've, what we think, mate. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, how... Well, I mean, there he's just saying, kids protest because kids are resentful. And I mean, he, he mainly only sees kids protesting because he's at university. Right. So he's, he doesn't see working class movements or movements of people with concrete demands to improve their life in the here I mean, and it- now. Presumably in Iran recently with other protests there, presumably he supported that to an extent. I mean, does he think that was his kids? Well, that's, or was that a legitimate grievance? Well, he doesn't give us any way of finding out what is and what is not a legitimate grievance. I mean, to be honest, if you, if you see there, he, he does actually. So he says a, a grievance is only legitimate if it's so, if it becomes dysfunctional for the current order. Right. So he's saying we can't let people get too poor because especially if we let young men get poor, they'll revolt and that might bring down the system. So he's basically got this functional idea that we need the left for functional reasons to keep the poor just uh, wealthy enough to not do revolution, mm. um, but no more. Because if we, if we give them any more, that's, that's very dangerous. There's a quote um, after the Great Reform Act in Britain, 1832. It's kind of the first step to a democracy in this country. And it extends the the franchise to middle class. It gets rid of things called rotten boroughs. does all sorts of things. And um, there was a quote, but I can't remember who said it. And it was, reforms that you may preserve was the line. And effectively, I think that seems to be his politics, where, again, it's, you know, you would only reform to maintain the social order, Mm. which I think seems kind of at odds with some of his more reactionary points around, for instance, things like marriage or women in the workplace. Well, he didn't think that was necessary, you see. So, so probably what he would have said is that, and he's, he talks about reform to divorce, it, to divorce laws as if it was pushed for by a small minority. So he basically thinks right. if, the, if the moral majority had, had spoken out against this minority, then they could have quite comfortably kept that current social order and, and it would have been stable if there was just a bit more grit from the right at that point to say like, no, he likes, he likes saying no. This is 
Raw. I can't do his voice, but that's yes, yes, right. you need to like come at the front. Yeah, you need to come at the front. I don't want to get personal. But he thinks people point people here. should stand up and say no, this is wrong. When any kind of minority demands their rights and say no, you're being resentful. No, we need to keep the social order, unless it's become so unequal it's dysfunctional. But how do we know? How do we know when that's the case? I just find the whole thing so bizarre. Look at look at people of color in the U.S., African Americans in particular. Now, there's an argument, a countervailing argument that says there's no racism in the U.S., especially police racism, because, uh, and this is true, black people in the U.S. are far more likely to be killed by other black people in black-on-black crime. But the point is, on the left, we would understand that as an outgrowth of social and economic inequality. Of course, coming from slavery, but even more recently, in 1945, you get the GI Bill, you get it also after Korea, also after Vietnam, this privileges veterans, especially after World War II, to mortgage credit, free university tuition, uh, business loans. African Americans don't really get that stuff. So already you're seeing different, you know, he talks about we don't want opportunity of outcome, we want opportunity of, um, uh, we don't want equality of uh, outcome, we want equality of opportunity. You can see quite clearly there, there are these massive mm. divergences historically between white and black people in America around equality, equality of opportunity. Uh, and yet, again, I think, again, I, I don't even think it's, that he disagrees with that. I don't think he knows it. Mm. I mean, it's so weird that he's making these public declarations around politics. His background is psychology. Actually, some of the biblical stuff in the book I find interesting. Uh, but it's the most unscientific stuff I've ever engaged with. And yet, uh, it seems to be forming the bedrock for this, this pseudo-scientific right, primarily on YouTube, uh, which thinks, I mean, it's really intellectually resourced, which, believe me, it isn't. We have sociology, we have social science to understand social facts. We don't need to talk about uh, Jung. Well, we can. It's a variable, but not a big one. I think two, two things to take seriously about Jordan Peterson. So one is that I think some of the places where he is strongest is where the left is weakest. So in the Shuha Haider piece I was discussing, he was sort of arguing with Peterson because he hadn't properly read Derrida. But then... Haider goes on in the piece to say that, oh, I've just got rid of it, to say that what he was arguing against was what Peterson was claiming Derrida said was that uh, there's just a suspicion of all objective truth in service of some kind of moralising politics of identity. So he's saying, he's imposing on Derrida this idea that there is no objective truth. And Haider's saying... Derrida never actually said that. But Haider also says that this has actually become one of the key interpretations of Derrida in American campus universities um, between the 1980s and the 1990s. So this idea of total relativism and this idea that there is no objective truth, science, language, everything is just constructed by power relations, which did become quite a big deal in literature departments, for example. Yeah, but not in the social sciences. And, I mean, no, but he's, it, got, no, he's just invisibilizing all of political science. No, but what I'm saying is it, it, it got quite a lot of traction within the left and on campuses. Or bits of the left in the US, and, sure. Yeah, and it, was quite, but, and it was quite weak. And also the fact that this has got so popular means that some people are, they're not just fooled, they're listening to what he's saying, which is one, maybe because they... they saw that particular part of the left which we know at times is can be quite silencing 100 percent um and can be yeah quite fucking difficult to be part of and doesn't offer much to any newcomer because it's telling you you're you're bad and whatever you say is problematic and just to use a word is sort of like imposing your particular power privileges in that situation right this is not many people like this is not many people i I saw some people on twitter saying that white people shouldn't go and watch black panther they should let like black people watch it first it's a film made under capitalism you fucking dickhead the actors the shareholders the producers the movie production companies the marketing companies they all want everybody to see it as much as possible it's a commodity produced for exchange and profit this idea like hey, let the black people have their film. And also it's very, very insulting to people of colour. The idea that they're just going to all watch things and go, hey, Wakanda, my place, this fucking made-up Marvel country. Uh, But that is a very, like you say, it's a very minor part of the left, which Jordan Peterson likes to caricature and overstate so that like with this C-17 stuff, he can make himself look more credible, more legitimate. He does overstate it, but it's also one of the reasons, we've talked about it before on the show, but one of the reasons Angela Nagel's book was so successful and it's a similar critique of the left which is that it's 
without all the particular background that Jordan Peterson draws from, but this idea that it's quite uh, obsessed with privilege in a sense <clears throat> and a particular way of using language because it sees language as a way that you can cause harm. Um, and so you have to be very, very careful all the time with what kind of language you right, use. And you have, to, modi- you have to modify your language all the time. Mm. So one of the reasons that book was so successful is because people really recognised it. People thought, oh, yeah, that does happen. And that, that is holding back the left. So the fact, so I think it's a bit disingenuous to say that doesn't exist on the left. Oh, no, it I mean, the, the reason the we know it exists on the it left is because the critiques of it are so fucking popular. And, and because we've all seen it. What Jordan Peterson is saying is that this is the left. That's the point. Yeah, that's, right? that's, that's the point. And in but an I'm era saying... of Bernie Sanders, Jeremy Corbyn, Ada Kalau, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, I mean, that's obviously, you know, Jean-Luc Mélenchon is not going to the French electorate. I think the guy's got a great shot of winning the presidency in a few years' time in France. He's not, you know, building uh, a political platform on um, uh, cultural relativism, yeah. right? No, I mean, absolutely. He's not engaging seriously with the left, but I'm saying one of the reasons it's been so successful is because that is a real strain on the left it is a real strain on the left that people recognize and see and he is arguing against it sometimes where it's most weak which is on its idea that there is no objective reality and everything's just power relations which does exist and that there are people who will say that there is no biological connection between sex and gender which i mean there is that doesn't mean it should constrain you within a prison and if you want to have a different identity you shouldn't be able to Mm. but the idea that the the development of men and women didn't give them any sort of different ways of behaving at the margins on average is mm. is just bad science so but that that would that shocks many people on the left if you say that and i think there are some of these weaknesses and that's why kathy newman kind of struggled because it is there are some things that are unsayable which he says in a fairly convincing way even though he takes it in a direction which is bizarre also, I mean, going back to this kind of idea, and we're going to finish up here, I guess. It's been a great podcast. I mean, I think the one last thing is just to say, why, why is it so popular? And it's because it's talking about, it's a kind of small-c conservatism, mm. which does offer people something to work with, which is small-c conservatism. So in um, the Tennessee Coates book I've been reading recently, he talks about black conservatism in one of the chapters. And he mm. says it's, it's a genuine strain of black politics, which shouldn't be dismissed, which is saying... What you need to look at is yourself first. You need to look at your community and how you're going to lift yourself up instead of blaming everything on political structures and removing your agency in that sense. I mean, obviously, it's not true. Well, there's some truth in both of these positions, right? So this idea that you should look at yourself and think about personal responsibility is reasonable. And that's why it's so successful, because people are reading this book and thinking like, yeah, this is actually the way I can improve my lot. It's by thinking about myself, by thinking about how I relate to the world and working on it. I can't just blame everything. I mean, it's not an either or, right? It's not an either or, yeah. This goes back to the whole Tolstoy thing, you know, where it says better to change yourself than change the world. And it's then fed into a lot of 21st century anarchism as well as right-wing thinking. I mean, it's just, hey, do both. And also, actually, this is the, the... the, one of the foundational ideas of Marx is that in trying to transform society, you also transform yourself. In trying to transform your personal conditions, you also help and contribute to the transformation of society. So there's the, this kind of <clears throat> a mutually reinforcing relationship between the two. But what I wanted to say about uh, Peterson in the late 19th century was we had lots of these people, the, the fin de siècle, the end of the century in the late 19th century. Um, and they were talking about cultural degeneration they were talking about, um, you know, the, the, the decline of the West, mm. as Spengler called it. And they viewed the Enlightenment, European values as being in decline. And really, this is an outgrowth of the fact you have urbanization, you have an ex- a population explosion amongst the working classes. Uh, you don't yet have social systems which lead or lend themselves rather to a social cohesion and stability. Very volatile period. You have anarchists killing all sorts of people in the early 1900s, heads of states and so on. An Italian king Umberto was killed by an anarchist. Um, a president was killed in the US, McKinley, I think, uh, around that time. So it's an amazing time. And then you have people like Max Nordau, who wrote a book called Degeneration. Or you have uh, Charles Baudelaire, who's his, uh, the flowers of evil, appointed to by people on the right as saying, look, these people are just degenerates, drinking their absinthe with their sex workers and their degenerate art, Picasso, modernism. And they say, this is Europe in decline. This is not the Europe of da Vinci and Michelangelo and all these things. And 
Jordan Peterson's doing the same thing. Mm. Now, I wonder why... Now, that resonated significantly at the end of the 19th century. Frederick Nietzsche did the same thing, by the way. And I wonder why um, Peterson's resonating with the same message today. And if we are ourselves in a kind of fin de siècle moment... Um, I think we may be, because like the end of the 19th century, was the, it was an end of an era in terms of progressive globalization. A certain brand of liberal nationalism was failing. It obviously fails fundamentally in 1914. Uh, but I wonder if that's a moment we're in now where people are looking for new values. And I don't mm. mean new values as in like a new pair of socks. I mean a whole new world view. Uh, and I think when we talk about ideas on the left and progressive politics, I personally think that's the scale we need to be thinking at. So in the 21st century, we're going to have ageing populations, minority-majority countries, the US and the UK. Most people won't be white. What kind of politics do we want? And I think it's going to have to be a radical offer or these people become uh, increasingly influential. And I'm sure there'll be more intelligent ones coming after Peterson. Mm. No, I mean, I should add that. I'd say that one of the reasons it's popular is because it speaks to I think a, a legitimate emphasis on self-improvement, which I don't think we sh- should deny as a part of politics. Um, but it is also, it just so happens that all his philosophical arguments defend the privilege of um, white men or rich men. Um, and that there is a reactionary sense in that it's trying to hold back progress, which which does affect sort of like whole classes of people's privileges that they currently exist at the expense of other people. And so I remember Alex Jones when he was sort of defending the West. He was, we gave the world the Enlightenment, the Renaissance, liberal capitalism. It's like these are all different things. Okay, uh, the Renaissance is founded upon modern republicanism, the idea of radical democracy, self-government. That's very different to the liberal tradition about private property, self-ownership of your labour comes out of John Locke. These are distinct traditions. I'm, they're both interesting traditions, very very valuable. But there's this weird elision in the construction of his, like sort of European history amongst the right, where they're saying that like Protestant capitalism, which is basically the, you know, the basis of the US, is the same as the Italian Renaissance. Like, hey, these people disagree on quite a few things. Um, anyway, I mean, it is weird. I was listening to a podcast with Milo Yiannopoulos the other day, and the guy was a radical Catholic, and he was saying that actually the, the American Republic is a Catholic Republic. Uh, because it has such a you know a centrality of natural natural rights, which isn't there in the Protestant tradition. That's the level that the new right is now thinking on. I think, which is, I mean, it's instructive, and the left needs to respond, mm. right? Absolutely. Okay. It's getting lots of hits. It's getting lots of hits. Although <laughs> I don't know if you saw Milo selling um, supplements on Alex Jones on Infowars earlier today. Oh, was he? It's kind of sad, right? <laughs> well, it is. I mean, it's also incredibly successful. I mean, they make money from those weird. Not, not, well, not I'm, tropics, sure, I'm pretty they? sure Milo wouldn't want to do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, he's fallen from grace, if that's the right way to put I it. I mean, that shows he's you... fallen actually, from heights. It, fo- it shows you the effectiveness of... I mean, I, 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 I think there's limits to this stuff, like shutting stuff down. I mean, I mean, his career's badly damaged. He got screwed over because of the paedophilia thing, though, right? Of course, but leave, you know, being kicked off Twitter, et cetera, et mm. cetera. I mean, it's... He was getting scarily influential around a year ago. Maybe a bit more. Yeah, and he's just gone. Yeah. On that note, uh, we'll be making this a fortnightly thing, right? Yeah. And I guess if you like this approach, this kind of live podcast thing, we want to do more shows like that. Uh, we're thinking about doing it with all the best. Uh, so if you like it, feedback. If this is the first time you're watching, this is NavarroMedia.com. This is Michael Walker. I'm Aaron Bastani. Um if you like what we're doing, support.navarramedia.com. We're building a new media for a different politics to take on the people we've been talking about today. So again, like I say, I'll see you in two weeks. We've got Navarra FM this Friday talking about media reform. And we've got The Fix mm. next Monday, our weekly uh, show on Monday evenings. So regardless, I guess we'll see you soon. Bye.